Hello there, I'm Jimmy Vegas and this is the Ultimate Unity Tutorial and welcome to episode 3. So this time we're going to carry on looking at our terrain and we're going to look at some things we can add to our terrain, so some details, things like grass, things like trees. We'll also bring in a player and we'll also look at our first script. Now what we'll do first off is we'll bring in the player to our scene and what you'll need to do is down here in the asset window, right click, and go to import package and this list you see here is the standard asset so when you originally installed your standard assets with unity it installed all this here and what standard assets are, are basically not a way of cheating but it's assets that are pre-built by unity themselves for you to use in your game so in this case we want to click on characters now I've already pre-installed the standard assets for characters as we can see down here but when you click it yourself you'll get a little window here with some files and you'll just need to click import down here so where I have the button OK you'll have import just make sure you click that it'll take not too long to just bring them assets into your project but when it does click down here on standard assets and you'll notice you get a load of folders here and we need to click on characters and then first person controller and then prefabs. Now a prefab is like a collection of objects, you can think of it as that basically, and it can have scripts attached to those objects, and we just drag and drop into our scene. And you'll notice in the hierarchy it brings it in as a blue colour. That just basically means because it's a prefab that we've brought in from our assets down here. Uh, you can see it's two objects and they each have scripts and components attached. And the great thing about this, the first person controller, is when we double click it, and bring it out of the ground it's playable what we have there is completely playable now the reason we drag it out of the ground we can see this green aura around it that represents the collider so when a collider hits something it will stop it from moving but if a collider is already colliding with something it kind of defaults and the player could end up falling through the ground which we don't want just make sure we drag it up on the y-axis just to get it up above the terrain so now we have the player in, all we need to do is turn off our main camera over here, so click it in the hierarchy and untick over here and we can press play. Now controls are standard, mouse to look around, WASD to move around and hold shift to run. So you can see already we're walking around in the world we've built. Doesn't look fantastic at the moment but there's a lot more to learn. So hold control, press P to stop playing and you'll come back to your scene view. So what we'll do now is we'll bring in some assets to decorate our terrain. So we'll bring in some trees and grass. So back to the assets, let's click on little arrow next to standard assets to close that up. And let's create a new folder. So right click, create folder and let's call this terrain assets. And in this folder, what I'm going to do is bring in this tree and this grass. So I'm going to hold control to select them both and drag and drop them into this folder right here. Now you can head to the website and download these for free. Just go to the downloads and assets section, Unity Ultimate Tutorial, and go to episode three and you can download them. Just make sure you unzip them before you try dragging them into Unity itself because for some reason Unity doesn't allow, allow you to drag items from a zipped folder. So once that's done, you'll have tree 01 and grass flow. So let's get these on our terrain. So click terrain and let's start with, let's start with the trees. If we click this, paint trees, and we'll need to define a tree first of all. So if we go to edit trees, go to add tree, and here you'll see tree prefab. We just need to select the game object to input there. So in tree 01, we have something called tree 02. And we can place it in there, no problem. Click on add. If we zoom out a little, hold the middle mouse wheel, let's move it this way a touch. And you can see that we have a big massive blue area where it's ready to paint this tree. So let's reduce the brush size, make it a bit smaller. We'll make the tree density high so there's gonna be plenty of trees within this blue circle. We will create a random height between these two points. So we want it not too tall, but not too short. So it'll randomize each tree to this height. We can also lock the width to the height so it makes it relative. And color variation, uh, we'll keep a 0.4, but you can change, increase, decrease to keep the colors um, kind of varied if you want, because if you have it massively varied, you may end up with 
not black trees, but quite dark trees which look a little bit out of place. So I think a figure of 0 0.4 is quite normal. But all it is is a case of just clicking. And you can see, there's our trees. So now we're creating ourselves kind of a forest, really. So next thing to do is let's create some grass. Now this is where it starts getting cool. So if we go to our paint details here, we need to do pretty much the same sort of thing and define our grass. So back in our terrain assets, we have this grass flow. So edit details, add grass texture, and we can drag and drop this into here where it says paint detail. Now you can change the healthy color and dry color if you want to. Um, it's not massively important. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because this will kind of come into play when we look at more into graphics and detail. Uh, for now, I'll just click on add and we can probably modify as we go along. Opacity, I'm gonna set quite high. Brush size, we're gonna set, we'll keep it as 36. Target strength, we'll keep as one. And we just need to click. And you can see the grass being created around us. So remember when I said we don't need to worry too much about the dry color and healthy color? Well, here's a perfect time to explore that. So if we click on, make sure you have the grass flow selected, edit details and go to edit, we can actually change the healthy color. So let's select our little pipette tool and let's select this, maybe a green here. And you can see that the grass changes color instantly. So we can also select the healthy color itself and maybe try dragging around here and seeing what kind of color you would like with your grass. So we could also do the same with the dry color. So we could select it to keep it kind of very green and you can see just how green this is affecting now. So here you would have maybe a summer kind of view. If you changed it to yellow, you'd have a kind of fall or autumn kind of feeling to your grass. So I'm gonna have it kind of very green and click apply. So if we press play again, we'll be able to see just how much this is impacting our game. Now you can see the grass in motion already, uh, but not the trees. This is because in our terrain settings over here, we can actually set the wind speed for the grass. So we can see just how much we want it. So let's set this a bit lower. Let's have this speed of about 0 0.1, size of about 0 0.2, and Ben maybe, whoops, how about 0 0.2? and we'll keep the bending at 0 0.5. Uh, one thing we'll do lastly with the grass is let's change its height. So back to edit details, back to edit, and you can see here minimum width, minimum uh, height here. So let's change the minimum height to 0 0.5 and the maximum height to one. What this will do is kind of shrink the grass a little bit, maybe put it in a bit more relative perspective towards our player, as we can see. So it's starting to look a little bit better, this game. Eventually, we'll play around with the trees and use something called wind zones. And we're doing that pretty soon, I think. Um, wind zones are basically a way of controlling how trees react in certain environments. For example, a storm. For example, maybe if you want to go like a portal or something, which makes it go a little bit funky when you enter it. But we'll get to that further in the series. So next thing, let's bring in something that we can create a script upon. So what I'll do is right click, create, and let's create a new folder and let's call it objects. So what I'm gonna do is bring in a, a gem. And what we'll do is we'll create a script which will allow this gem to rotate relative to the world and time. So let's bring in this gem folder and place in our objects folder. And again, you can get this for free on the website, head over there. And in there, we have another prefab and we have a couple of different gem styles here, but let's use a classic style. You'll notice they are a little bit pink and a little bit small, and we can always change that. So let's change the scale to, let's have 25 by 25 by 25. Double click. And let's bring it up out the ground. And let's quickly create a nice material for it. So right click, create a material down here. And let's call this, gem mat. Now we've already worked with material, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but let's have a nice blue colored gem. Select color. Let's have it quite metallic, maybe. 
and smooth. And let's just drag and drop that onto there. So that looks okay for now. So now let's create a script to rotate this. Assets folder again, right click, create, C sharp script. And let's call this gem rotate. So as I say, we'll be doing all this in C sharp. Uh, but in fact, what we might do is just create a new folder first, just to create all scripts in one folder. So let's just drag and drop that gem rotate into there. And if we double click on the script, we can open it up in either Mono Develop or Visual Studio. I'll be using Visual Studio for this series, as I do believe that as of Unity 2018, um, Mono Develop will not be part of Unity. If you have an older version of Unity, that's fine. You can use Mono Develop if you wish. Uh, the script will remain the same, whatever you use. So, as we load this up, we can see that first time initializing Visual Studio within a project may take just a couple of minutes, but once you have it open, you'll be able to open scripts up pretty quickly. It's not too drastic. I think Visual Studio itself may be a little bit slower than uh, Mono Develop in this respect, but that's not to worry at all. So when the script opens, we're going to go through a couple of things in the um, script first, because there's things you need to know when it comes to C-sharp scripting. It's not as simple as JavaScript or Unity script. So here at the top, we have something called a namespace. Now a namespace is where you can define uh, something which may be later used in a script. For example, if we use some UI, then we may need to use the namespace using unityengine.ui. But for simple scripts like this one, the default setting up here is all fine. Just to remember, this is called the namespace. Next thing we have here is the public class. Now the public class name has to be the exact same as your script name. So in this case, gem rotate. If you ever rename your script, you have to rename your public class here. And it's always gonna be mono behavior. Down below, we have something called void start and void update. And you can see here these double slash lines, they aren't included in the code, they're just uh, annotations. So little notes you want to make throughout the script. We can delete these because they're not important right now. So here, void start, we don't actually need. What we need is void update. The difference is void start is a script which starts straight away. Void update is something that's called every frame of the game. And because we want to constantly rotate this item, we just basically have void update. So we can delete void start. Now these methods are always pretty much the same. You have void or I enumerator. We'll get into I enumerator later on. Uh, the name, in this case update, two colons or parentheses, and then we have the curly brackets which open and close, meaning this is where it starts, this is where it ends. So what we need to do is declare uh, some variables. And what we'll do is we will define something called an integer, and an integer is a whole number. We also have float, which is a decimal, but we'll do a float probably next episode. So to define a variable, we do public, and then the type, in this case, integer, so we put int, and then the name, so in this case, rotate, speed, and then a semicolon. So the semicolon means that that line has ended there is no further uh, scripting within that line, move on to the next line. So in this case, what we'll do is in void update, we can set our rotate speed as two, or we could, if we wanted to, uh, do it through the interface of Unity itself, which is what we'll do in this case. So the only real line of code we will need is to rotate uh, this particular object on the y-axis, so it rotates around. So transform dot rotate. Now, with the word transform, it needs to be lowercase. With the word rotate, it does need a capitalized R. Scripting is case sensitive. You always have to remember that. So in this case, if we'd have put a lowercase R, this script would not work. So in brackets, we need to put the X, Y, and Z or Z uh, numbers. So we don't want to rotate at all on the X. So we put zero, comma, 
we do want to rotate on the Y and we want to rotate by the rotate speed that we're going to set. So in this case, rotate speed, comma, we don't want to rotate on the Z, so zero, comma, and we also need to do it relative to the world around us. So we do need to use space dot world. That is that script complete. So we can hold control, press S to save, or go to file and save. And then in Unity, we can simple, oh, it's telling me I forgot a semicolon there. It's a school by error. So remember, at the end of that line, we always need that semicolon. The reason I knew that is because down here, it did say so. Usually, if you created an error in scripting, it will tell you down here and in the console. We'll get onto that at a later date anyway, because the console will become vital when we get into deep scripting. So to make this script work with this gem, we just need to drag and drop onto the gem itself. And then if we click it, we can see here, it's actually now a component. So let's set the rotate speed here. Let's set it as one. And then let's press play. And we should be able to see, if we go over, we can see the gem rotating nicely. Now the great thing about this is we can actually change it real time. So let's set this to 10. We can see it rotating real fast. Set it back to one and it's all real time. It's great. So next episode, what I think we'll do is we will look at some uh, sound effects. We'll probably look at some water and we'll also look at a bit more C sharp scripting and go into that a little bit more, uh, well, some more detail. So until that next episode, guys, Thank you very much for watching.